Um, uh, before we start with GraphQL, right? So this talk is all about GraphQL. What is GraphQL? What are mutations? What are queries? But uh, taking into account the kind of audience we have today, like people from college and you know the things that you have done already. So um, you people have worked on REST, REST APIs, POST, GET, and all. You this you know. Okay, cool. So let's say that I am asking you to have something which is on the top of your REST APIs, okay? And then consume your responses. Or maybe you can bypass the REST APIs and GraphQL can sit in between your data source and your client. So that is what a GraphQL is. Just for introduction, like for you guys, many other people who have already worked might know what GraphQL is, but for you it's this, okay? Let's, let's understand in this manner that GraphQL can be a mediator sitting between your APIs, your data sources, as well as some other third-party APIs. Yeah. And it will be a mediator to your client. Client could be anything, your mobile applications, your web applications, right? It could be anything. Make sense? Yeah. So now this is not an alien thing to you, GraphQL, right? Okay. Cool. So let's say, um, let's go through these topics that we are going to cover. What is GraphQL? And what was the actual problem with REST? Because REST is already there, right? I mean, why do you want to have something else on the top of it? And how GraphQL solve it? Whatever the problem REST gave you, how does it solve it? And why use GraphQL? What are the advantages you will get out of it, right? Everything has some benefit, right? If you come here, you might see some benefit and then you came here, right? Otherwise, there is no point coming in here. You travel, you, you came here, you spend some money and you spend your time. So why uh, to use GraphQL? Then we have some introduction, like uh, how to how to you know start with a uh, how to use your resolvers, how to have queries and all. What is the architectural use cases? In which scenarios? In like uh, because I said it is a middle layer sitting or maybe a very initial layer to your data sources. Uh, what could be the possible architectural cases for GraphQL? Everything comes with problems also. It's not like everything is green and shiny. GraphQL has its own problems. So what are the problems for GraphQL and how we can overcome on that? Then, um, which organizations are using GraphQL? Let me uh, just drag down it to somewhere bottom. Okay, cool. Okay. So, more. All right, so let's first say that what GraphQL is. Is it a language? Is it a data source? Is it some sort of another frame framework? What is that? Right? So as you can see, it's it's uh, actually a language. Okay, GraphQL is a language. It's not a framework. It's not a database. It's not something else. It's a language. Okay, this was designed by Facebook in the year twenty twelve, and uh, it was open sourced. Oh, sorry, it was developed by Facebook, and twenty twelve they open sourced basically. Uh, they released the stable version in 2018 for GraphQL part and uh, uh, this also moved to a, a like a non-profit non foundation that is being honored by your link, uh, Linux. Um, when Facebook started developing the GraphQL part, they had some kind of requirement. That's why they developed GraphQL. Why? Because if you have seen uh, Facebook has lot, lot of data, lots of data regarding your user. So user has also uh, many data. Like suppose you log into your Facebook accounts, right? Uh, you have your posts, multiple posts that you might have uh, already done, right? You have uh, comments on these posts. You have likes on these posts. You have followers, right? And these followers then again have multiple data. And all. Facebook does also, uh, you know, observe your activities like which you have liked, which you don't, and many other things. Right? So that's a, like a huge nested data. And now, um, I mean, after people have mobile phones, it's not only your laptop, which is you, for you to connect to the world. Generally, people prefer to have mobile phone uh, and access the internet via applications, even via web apps also. There are web apps which are very beautifully looking on your phone without even using any app, right? So the when the era came for mobiles, and we wanted to have a speedy network. But of course, when mobile started, we don't, didn't have that high network speeds, right? Even if we have, mobile has some sort of, uh, I would say, um, 
your machinery uh, lagging behind your laptop is high in your uh, everything resources and all but mobile doesn't have that kind of bandwidth so overcome these kind of situations they develop graphql part right netflix and coursera were also in competition when they started uh, with the uh, graphql part though when they publicized it they made it public graphql so uh, coursera i guess coursera dropped it and then netflix uh, did release something which is for fulgur so it's uh, like an alternative for your graphql part that's a basic introduction like how it came into the picture and what were the other alternatives in the market at that point of time right um let's see a problem statement a small problem statement okay suppose in a blog application blog as in you can you could say your facebook part or a blog blog is what you type you type something you post something and there will be some author associated to that blog correct and you could have your followers like in your blogging applications they people do follow you if you have good content right so if that has to be done with rest api how it could have been done so let's say that i would have these kind of endpoints i hope these endpoints similar uh, like very familiar like slash authors and id i would get the data for that particular author right authors id and post meaning for particular author which is having this id i would get all the posts make sense and then i would have something called followers for that associated author which is going to have authors id and followers it seems simple right rest is simple you say authors id i'll get the uh, authors detail post details and followers detail consider a scenario where you have to render this information in your front end it's not only back end right you have to make api calls how many three right and making api calls is expensive right sending data over to the network is expensive it's like huge data coming along when we say posts lo lots of posts are coming coming right so there is a problem we cannot deny it to that part right? and the kind of data that it will give you is going to be like this so you have author author id name address birthday even if i do not even need that birthday on that particular page where i need to see my posts so suppose you are on home page okay and you want to see all the post of a user do i need that birthday at that point of time no right this data is like extra data that came along with the rest response right and if i say post you have your id title content comments and many more if i am just showing my post how does it look like like a dialog box your title content number of comments do i see the entire comment section just on the top of my post not at that point of time unless until you click it correct then you see the lot of comments what comments come on the page right so it uh, basically rest give you the data the entire bunch of data will come on the on the network itself though if, even if i do not need it that point of time uh, i might consume it later but why to have it over my mobile which is you know not that strong enough for that kind of bandwidth or that kind of payload right similarly with followers followers is what a user dt just like we had in author it's the same entity right it's it's just that i'll have a lot of followers for that particular author right now uh, do i need address for that particular follower i just need to show that number of followers right why do i need address but rest will give me because that's how the data has been structured it will give you user array and user has these details right so this is the kind of problem we had with rest and please don't forget for this kind of data i need to call three apis if there is nothing like a middleware sitting in between merging these three api call into one so that the front end only makes one right and also the kind of data that is coming along i am not uh, happy with the kind of data right so i need something to sort it out so what was the, what was the problem one is overfetching i hope you understand what overfetching is from the example right n plus 1 underfetching now overfetching means you get data which you don't need underfetching means you you wanted to have some kind of data but you didn't get it in the first api call i need to make three api calls so that's like a n plus 1 network calls i have to make network request multiple network traffic you are creating right lot of requests going on lot of response coming in and uh, there is static nature of rest you cannot ask rest yaar mere ko na i don't need birthdays just don't give me birthday details you can you can do that unless until you don't create another endpoint unless until you don't have that kind of data structure asking rest hey i will say uh, you can get your data without that birthdays unless until there is not that particularly statically defined structure for rest right then we have version and evolution 
versioning comes in like suppose today maybe this point of time i need some kind of data later on i might not need some of the fields or maybe there are additional fields being added upon right how does it, it happens i mean a lot of time when you have production apps and all so what do we do we create versions like v1 version v2 version right and maybe some users might be consuming v1 version of the apis some will be consuming v2 version of the apis depending right you cannot force users to hey up upgrade your uh, app you cannot force always unless until it's like a very huge breaking change correct so how graphql solve solve this problem so if you see uh, this is a kind of query on the left hand side right that, that's a kind of query you will give on graphql okay and that's the endpoint there were three endpoints graphql only deals with one endpoint it's like always slash graphql that's it the kind of data you want to query you can give on the query part so i said i need author i pass my id right i said i need name for that so everybody understand json object that's a json object right everybody understand okay so i said that for author right i need name post and for particular post i would need title so all the extra data that was coming on the rest api i don't need that i only need title then for followers i just need name nothing else or maybe i could have asked like give me all the count of the followers and all right so this is the kind of response that you will get out of your graphql part okay so i don't think i need to explain it any further regarding your overfetching underfetching right how it solves your problem there were multiple requests but now we have only one api call that i, I mean basically one post graphql is everything is post okay so and why use graphql uh let's go back i would like to ask you guys why would you use graphql i mean because we have been given some little introduction so any any single point that you think okay uh this i understood i could use graphql for this particular requirement any anything that you can come up with any requirement correct yes any any more ideas that you would like to use graphql i mean if you don't find one i, I can show you the points but if in case you would you know you would want to think about it like why graphql any any problem? okay yeah yeah you can Right. Huh. Yeah. and fetching, right? So this is the main concept, right? There is one more thing that I didn't mention. It's documentation. So for REST APIs, uh, did you guys have used Postman or any? You have used Postman, right? So when you make a call on Postman, maybe a get or a put or patch or delete, whatever, right? Do you get some kind of reference? Hey, you can make a post call. And your data should be like this. Your body should look like this. And this is the response you will get. You don't get any of it in Postman. It's just hit and try. You hit it and then you get the response. You don't get a documented version, right? I mean, Postman is a tool, but for REST APIs, you have to create your documentation on your own. Swagger, if anybody have heard of Swagger, we have Sw Swagger documents. So Swagger is used for creating documentation for your APIs. Like um, for post call, I have this body. And this is, will be the expected response. These fields will be there. So you have to create your own documentation. GraphQL, it will give you on its own. It does give you this entire schema. Hey, for this particular thing, if you want to have this query, I will give you these number of fields. This is the name. This is the type. And this is how you can query. For any mutation, this is going to be like this. So it does documentation for your own. It makes your task easier as somebody who is using it. Right. You don't have to create documentation. And once you are using your GraphQL endpoint, you don't have to look for some introspection. Hey, how, how uh, I shall send the data. I mean, suppose that you are working in one team. Somebody is working on different team. Now you have to consume that particular API. You might need to ask them, how do I you know, use that API? What is the kind of request you expect? What is the kind of response I shall exp expect? But here, if you have a particular documentation, this part is easier. Correct. Uh, we have some code sharing fragments. So code sharing, you know, like a functional reusability that we talk in coding language, right? When we say fragments, that means what is a fragment in English general language, like a part of something, correct? So when you develop a query, when you query something, you can create fragments on that query so that that could be re reutilized some, somewhere else. 
okay you don't have to create it again you you could reutilize that part then uh, talking about the error message rest apis give you error codes 404 500 internal server error right these kind of codes you will get here you will get detail error detail means this broke even if some query did broke right you are querying something it will pass you the entire path in this query this failed and that happened the rest doesn't give you like this it gives you code unless until you specifically uh, mention that you know this kind of error response should go like custom custom errors that you said though graphql has also the flexibility of throwing custom errors which you can create depending on your client's requirement right um there is one more interesting thing which is called subscriptions okay you subscribe right your youtube channels or some you do follow and it pops up hey this new thing came into picture right so so graphql also has something called subscriptions which means if you want to observe some kind of operation some kind of data that should come to you when once it changes suppose that um uh, let's say the kind of notification on your instagram somebody started following you or maybe requested to follow you you get a notification right that happens so that means you as a user has been subscribed to the change which says if anybody in the crowd follows you you will get some kind of notification how does it happen there is some some observer sitting at some place and then observing these events and then throwing it back to you so these subscriptions are uh, facilitated by graphql okay now uh, before we start to the coding part i just want to introduce you what is a query what is a mutation so that when we see your files and all we don't get feel confused okay so there are two uh, ways of having graphql one is your server side i will be mo more focusing on the server side part okay uh, then other part is your client side server everybody knows like there will be some apis coming along and then you know so server side how does it work on that part like taking data from your server manipulating and giving back to your client now when we say graphql is sitting in between your server and client that means there should be some mechanism sitting on the client side to throw that query right there should be sitting there should be some mechanism sitting on the server side to accept that particular query and then you know get the uh, result from your database or from your third party apis or any apis and then give it back to your client side similarly client should be capable enough to actually query do mutations get the data and then populate on your ele elements so we have something called type definitions. Type definitions are nothing. It's like a very type scripted form of schemas where you can specify every single thing. This is going to be my entities. This is going to be my queries. This is going to be my mutations. Mutations are you mutate, you change things. So changing means you add, you, you delete, you update. These are kind of mutations. Query means simply you get the data out of it. Okay. Schema and then we have resolvers. So resolvers take it as a function. Okay. Resolvers are something. So even if it is a query, even if it is a mutation, you need some resolvers to actually do some processing, get the data or mutate the data and then get back to the client. General meaning of these terms, okay? On the client side, similarly, we have queries, we have mutations and fragments, right? Now, I would not focus on this part. I would like to go to IntelliJ. Now, I have two apps running right now, currently. One is a node server, okay? And one is a GraphQL server sitting in between and to get the data, okay? This is my node part I'm showing you. So, um, I'll not go in detail because uh, it will might deviate. So, I'll just show you the structure and I'll also show you the DB part, okay? So uh, you see there are like three tables for now. One is a post, one is your product, and then we have user, okay? These are very simple data structures, not much complex, just to understand how GraphQL actually deal with the data. I have created three kind of tables now. Uh, let's say for the post part, I have these many posts, all right? There, that's ID, title, content, go publish, Hey, and hey, is published or not okay author id there is something called author id which is actually the id of particular user okay make sense so that user is here all right 
that user is here this id that you see is actually the reference id for that particular column for post okay and there's something very different table called product so we'll cover some basic things with these three tables okay product is nothing just your id name price created updated that's something at what time it has been created or updated now let's go back to your uh, this that's my node part that's the node express part and if i go to this thing so uh, that's uh, my server running on local host and the other one is also running on local host only and let me clear this for you okay let me show you postman first like how i am trying to get the data from the api and then how graphql is sitting in between that part so let's see my local host. I hope this is visible, right? Font is clear. Okay. okay. So let's say that I have something called local host 3000 products and a product ID. All right. I get this kind of data. Okay. And I can show you something else. Any other get call. So this is my user's data. Okay. This is a kind of user's data if you can see. I can open one for you. Uh, it says that for every user, I need the data. It's users, not a specific ID. I'm passing the users. And I can show you here, like, how does it work? For users, we have something called users route. And uh, for user route, I have get patch port update. And these are some sort of validation. So basically, that's a node server. And get SQLize and TypeScript. I'm using uh, Postgres SQL for my DB part. And uh, these are the validation that comes with express validation. That's a plugin you can have. Um, if you see these two things, that means it's a middleware which validates your requests. Is it even valid? Uh, you know, the ID is valid, the name is a string or not. These kind of validation that you generally do with the kind of request, right? So if you see the kind of data I get, I do get the user details. Okay. And I do get post as well. You see, I do get the post data as well. And not even single, I get the entire post data. Whatever post I had for that particular user, I get everything. Why? Because that was a reference ID. And for SQLize, I mean, SQLize is an ORM sitting in between your database and REST API to get data, to map data. Okay. Now, uh, I would like to show you one thing. Just a minute. Huh? There is something called build association here. Okay, what do I do? I build association for post and user. That's why you are seeing post data under users because they are mapped. They are like reference ID, referential integration between them. So if you go to post part, that's that's the kind of entity I have with post. So I have what? ID, title, content, published, and author ID. And, the, and if you see here, the association, I say that the post belongs to a user. So generally production data are not that simple, right? There could be many multiple referential integration between the tables, right? So that's one example of it. The intent of putting it this way is only because I wanted to show you like how actually table communicate with each other, okay? And if you go to the users part, this is my users table. This user has many posts because one user can have many posts and one post can only be associated to one author. Author could be one, right? Post could not have multiple author followers. Yes, of course, but not the post part. So that's how the data structure is. Product is simple as I already showed you. Um, now let's go back to your, uh, I would say this GraphQL report. Okay, now we will learn what is a query, what is a mutation. That's the basic of this part. Right? Um, okay, you see this Apollo server line number 13, right? So uh, basically you can have GraphQL uh, implemented with Apollo server or maybe a GraphQL uh, plugin as well, right? So I used Apollo. This That's Apollo and I use this one. Now, uh, you see there are a few configurations being passed to your particular server. In in order to create a server, I pass these particular things, right? I have type devs, I have resolvers. Resolvers are what? They are just functions to actually process your queries and mutations. Then I have your format error. That's a very generic and very basic thing. You can have really complex, customized error detail part. I just created this simple example. Uh, and I have something called a data source that I'll talk about. So uh, has anybody worked on Node before? Node, 
has anybody worked on node you worked on node okay for people who did not work on node uh, basically node part has something called express you 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 know the same as java you know but it's just bit different in syntax and all um cool so i have two apis here in my graphql wrapper one is your post api one is my product api okay post is not that post post is like a uh, blog post post okay uh if you see uh, i could have skipped it I, i'll tell you i could have skipped this data source for now i am using it for caching purpose i'll show you later how we are caching the response otherwise what i have could use i've use exios there is something called exios you might know right so you can make your calls get patch post from exios and you can be done with it but i did data source and then my api calls are being passed as a param here and that i'll show you so first let's cover a few things okay i have this kind of structure where i have a graphql uh, directory here i have some kind of utilities which i am going to use so i put it in that way we have some interfaces we have some services which is this one user service product service and post service i did not pass to user service here that means i am not having a cache response for that user service okay this will be your exios maybe so if you see this is exios okay so that's a differentiation i wanted to make like how does if you want to have caching in graphql how can you achieve that and without caching how it will look like it's a simple call it's a simple service where you have user service you get all the users you get user by the id you get uh, create user and update user and now what i'm doing i'm using exios to make that particular call okay but here if you see i have something called data source which i consume and then only i get to have my api i'll show you in the resolver part so that's it so let's let's take a few example now i would like to get data for product from my graphql server let's take this example and we'll try to run how we can get that from sitting at the graphql endpoint not at the my node express sitting on the my graphql server right now let's say i'll go to first index.ts that's how my server is and type def i can show you schema this is my schema so that's like my source of truth for me everything which is going to be sent which is going to be queried which is going to be mutated is sitting here okay i have product name id and price okay i have product edge don't don't consider this i'll, I'll tell you what edge connections are but let's first cover the basic parts okay so these connections thingy are for pagination that will cover later like what pagination ke how pagination will be achieved here. now uh, you see there is something called query that's a object called query and how many queries and what kind of queries i can ask from this graphql server this, this these many i can ask user passing id and then getting single user or maybe a list of users similarly with post there is different query for pagination i created just to make people understand like how pagination could work with graphql okay then we have post products and product pagination so there are two types of pagination i have implemented so that's why i have product pagination and post pagination we'll cover that out uh user you have pro post and yes these are the kind of inputs that you can pass as in like if you are making some mutation calls like creating a user you need to pass some body right the kind of data so that these are the input data okay and let's go to resolver and let's have a look so this is my resolver resolver is been divided into two parts one is a query and one is a mutation part right for query it's ha huh, one important point whatever you specify in resolver should be exactly same how it has been in schema you cannot deviate from that because that was the source of truth right i have products it should match the schema products here so see products where is products okay that should match so let's go to resolver and yes let's take an example what i wanted i wanted to get all the products right so that's my products this query i can uh, do and then get the details now if you see i have something called data source from which i am getting my product api and then i'm getting the products that meaning uh, as i mentioned for data source part that means the response is going to be cached so that's a way of caching it up i'll show you how i was caching it but it's just a reference for you so that when i mention later you you will be able to make a link okay if you go to users i just directly use my user service i'm not using my data source part i'm just using the uh, you know uh, user service and all users okay 
and I am thinking, okay, let's see. Now let's go to my server part first. That's my GraphQL server running on 4,000. 3,000 was my Node Express. Okay. Now let's say this one. Mm -hmm. I have passed something called uh, cursor and all, but you won't be needing it for now. I'll just show you a few things. Uh, this cursor and this uh, first that you are seeing right now, I'm not utilizing it. It is being passed in the query. But if you see, this is the actual truth. Uh, this is the actual query I'm trying to get. So let me comment it out for now. The other paginated response. Okay. And we are good. Yes. So I just want to have my products. Just the products, all the products. Okay. Don't don't uh, have a look here. It's just that say that it is unused and all. Right now we are not using it. So generally what you do, you pass, you say that it's a query. You pass your JSON kind of a thing. If you see the query, right, the query itself says what kind of response you could expect, right? It says you, you will have product, you will have ID, you will have name and price. So that's very introspective on its own. This is the kind of data I get. I get all the products. I have ID, name and price. And suppose that I don't need price. I just need ID and name. I can do that, right? I, I can have this kind of flexibility here, right? I don't need it. And suppose that I don't need even ID. I just need names. I can shorten the data line just by modifying the query itself, right? With the rest, you don't have that kind of flexibility. Now let's go back. Uh, I would like to. This is uh for your resolver now. Uh -huh. Let's take a view at resolver for this particular thing. So what we consumed? We consumed get all products, okay? And if you go here, uh, let me show you one thing. That's a way of having your cached thing. So let me introduce, uh, I don't want to cover cache here, I would cover it later, but you can just see that, you can consider this part, that if there is a cache response, I'll give you the cache data. If there is no cache response, I'll make a fresh API call and then give you the data, okay? So if I consider this part, this one, and it maybe let me show you this, uh, this one. It says uh, cache data came along because I have hit it earlier, I mean, later in the day today, and it has been cached and then I get the cache data. Otherwise, it will give me the real data. I have uh, did a log here, if you see, it's a cache data or if it's a real data. So it, it came as a cache, that means it's picking it from the cache part. Now let's come to the API, uh, to the presentation. Uh, okay. So schema, let, let's first deal with like what schema is, okay? So we used SDL to create the schema. It's a kind of a language that we use, okay? You give your types, like we have seen type user, type product and all, right? So to define a particular shape of request and response, right? You have fields, fields like I have ID, name, price, right? These are the fields. You have scalars, scalars we'll talk about later. Uh, query that you understand like the, it defines the kind of uh, data, the user, the consumer, the end consumer, right, will consume and also the kind of query, they will give it to the server and then get back the responses. Mutation, you know, like if you want to mutate the data, that's mutation. We have already covered queries. Now for creating a queries, right? Everything revolves around schema in GraphQL. If your schema is solid enough, you can have very uh, common paths. So uh, for creating a query type in schema, yeah, we use SDL that we already covered. Right? We add fields to the query type that we already seen in the schema, all the fields. We create resolvers to that for the particular field. So yes, resolvers actually have for particular query, like post, update post, get post, and also for particular field as well. Why I say particular field, uh, you see that for users, it does give me post data as well, right? Under users entity, I did get a post data as well. That's because how resolver works, it works in a breadth first manner. You, uh, when I say breadth first, uh, take it as a graph, like a tree. When it is named after graph, it means it functions on graphs, okay? It functions on trees. So when I say breadth first, that means this entire level will be covered and then you will get into the depth, okay? So 
for post that we've seen in the user's data, I can get you back to a particular postman. Now you see, you get your post under your users, right? So that's one depth. And for GraphQL, we have like, we cover first breadth. I'll show you in the PPTs, like how I meant by breadth for ping and all. It was always, we understood like it's a function to resolve the data for the particular client, whether it's a query or a mutation. And huh, let's understand these three things, these four things. So resolver has four kind of parents that we pass. One is your root. One is the arguments. Arguments could be, so suppose you're making a post call, right? You will be sending query parents or maybe a get call. You will be sending query parents, right? Like author slash ID. If you do it in a GraphQL manner, you will receive somewhere the that particular ID, right? So how you will receive that? You will receive in args. These are the arguments, okay? Context is something uh, that is a bit uh, long thing to explain, but uh, let's say that it's it's a kind of object, a data object, okay, which you can consume in the resolver and get things done. Like the data source, if you have seen in the code, right? What, what it is having? It is having your instances of your APIs, correct? I could have instances of my APIs. I could have uh, maybe some local data being stored as a context and then grabbing it, okay? And info is like a AST representation of the query or the mutations. That's the info part. These are the four resolver one parents. Huh. Now, when I say breadth first order, how it's been resolved and all, that's here. So let's say I have a query. And I say I have user ID ABC. And I would like to get ID and name for that particular user. Okay, How it's been interpreted and solved. So first part is this user id and abc all right it goes down here and uh, we mentioned four four parents for the resolvers so it's like parent arguments context and info that's underscore it's context and info okay now i get the id as abc right and here i mean for my case i have utilized some user service to get the user's data they have set fetch user by id and they have passed arguments dot id so that's how the query param, which was author slash ID being passed to that particular resolver. Okay. Now you get the ID. Here you get the ID. Now the third step is you mentioned I I would need ID and name under user. So you said that I need ID and name under user, right? So that's another level you have to resolve. So you resolved user by stating I need this particular user detail of ID, and then you resolve ID and name, which is under your user. Okay. Then I get to here and I said, uh, ID is ABC and name is Sarah. Suppose that you get your data from your DB saying particular this ID, this is the name and this is the ID. And that's how it is resolved. So uh, GraphQL gives you the opportunity, either you can define your own resolver for every field or you can define resolver just for the query. But GraphQL is intelligent enough to do that. So I did not write any resolver for ID and name particular either. I just write a resolver for user. But it was able to resolve ID and name as well. So that's how, uh, why? Because for the parent, right? For the first argument parent, the detail will go down the tree. So for user, it will achieve null because that was the first level, okay? Once you go inside one more level, that is ID and name, what you will receive? You will receive the data which came from your parent. So that's how the parent deals here. First is it's always null. The moment you start uh, uh, diving deep into that particular query, you will get data from that parent part. All right. And similarly, once you resolve that, you have your name. Name has been resolved on step four. Okay, you, you return the parent dot name. So this is something which you did not write. It is understood by GraphQL that how it has been resolved. Okay, And then for the final result on step five, you get the data. So creating resolvers, there are like four things you need to take care of. One of them I already mentioned, it should match exactly same with your schema. Right, your signature should exactly match with that. So we have resolver params must match exact field names. Then we have resolver must return the value type declared by the matching field. If you say in schema that I need post as a return object and in resolver you said I need product, it will dismatch, right? The return type should also match. Resolvers can be async. Okay, when I say async, do we know that uh, asynchronous processes like API calls are asynchronous, right? Your resolvers can be asynchronous. So if I have a look in your repo, you see, that's uh, that's a service here. And if I go to my resolver part, it's an async resolver. Why? Because I am making asynchronous process calls, correct? 
So that's async one. And so what's a server basically? Resolver, queries, mutation, everything combined in one thing. You serve the data to the client by resolving your queries mutation with the help of resolvers. That's a but that's a definition of that server. All right, GraphQL server. Um, we have mentioned fragments. Fragments are what like a part of queries. Okay, so suppose that I have a query get person, and uh, I want to have like fragment of data being imposed on that particular query. Then I say create a fragment name parts on person. And I would like to have only first name and last name. That's it. I don't want much information. I just want this so that we can have it. And how do you utilize or maybe consume your fragments is by this syntax, right? This is just like the same query we had earlier. It's just that for fragments, you just do these three dots. And now that means GraphQL understand when I say this, that means it is going to use the fragment, which is being declared in the schema. Yes, you have to declare that. Okay. You don't. Uh, get aside with the declaration or resolver part, you have to have these things in your schema being declared, okay? Uh, mutations, you already know mutations, how we can create mutations. So you add your fields, you add the arguments, you need the arguments, right? You create resolvers, you need resolvers, and yes, of course, SDL is defined to create the schema stuff, same. Um, now, there are a few things which has been left but just let's take a breather for like one or two minutes. I don't want to overwhelm you guys. Okay. So we had queries, we had mutations. We understand that there is something called subscriptions, like a live data update, right, for GraphQL. Of course, there are subscriptions everywhere, but with GraphQL, it is called this one. Um, and we have seen, uh, okay, let's talk about what is left. So I'll talk about architecture, like three, three kind of architecture places where GraphQL could be used. I'll talk about caching. I'll talk about pagination. And a little bit about your error part. So uh, just a brief introduction, like what is next? Now, till that point, is there any confusion? Any any questions? Anything? We are clear. Queries, mutations, resolvers, schemas, right? All good? OK. Do you need one minute break, or I can continue? Good. Continue? All right. No sleepy, nothing? Cool. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's say uh, the architecture part, right? GraphQL server can be connected directly to a database. For my instance, I mean, for my repo, right? I had a node server sitting and then a GraphQL in between, but you can have directly connection with your GraphQL. Any questions? So, or maybe GraphQL server that is a thin layer in front of the third party that can also ha happen. So um, let's take that till I have. I, you don't only need your APIs that you develop. You also consume third-party APIs, right? In a production level repo, that's how it is, right? So GraphQL can sit in between them, okay? Then we have hybrid approach of a connected database. A hybrid approach is something your GraphQL is sitting. There will be database, there will be APIs, there will be third-party APIs, and everything in one place. That's a, like a hybrid approach. Database approach is like GraphQL is communicating directly with your databases. Other thing could happen, there are REST APIs, there are databases, and then the GraphQL is sitting. So that's how it looks like. One is your uh, server directly connected with the database part. Okay. Then you have integrations, your micro. Do anybody understand microservices? Microservices? Everybody knows, right? Okay. So that's like sitting in between your microservices and your large third party APIs, or maybe your legacy system APIs. It could have happened in any kind of context, right? This is the hybrid approach where you have legacy systems, your third party, maybe database or anything like the way you want. That's how hybrid is. Huh. So now coming to caching, pagination, you can have authentication authorization. Of course, that's a you know very integral part of that. And there is one more important thing. I did not cover it in the repo, but you guys can. I mean, I did cover in node part, but not in GraphQL. So that's called validation. So you see Node Express uh, repo, there is some kind of validation that I showed you in the index.ts. I can show you again, maybe. So here, that's express part. And if I go to index.ts, so you see this part, validate, product create validation, right? This is like a middleware sitting in between and validating your request. That's been sitting on my node area, not in the GraphQL part. Now there could two things that can happen. 
one. If I gave a wrong request, I will get validation errors, right? That should be delivered in such a way that client could understand, right? So that they can correct themselves with the request, right? Now GraphQL is sitting in between. These errors should be passed from server to GraphQL and then GraphQL to your client, correct? Other way could happen is GraphQL could also have validations so that the wrong request could be stopped then and there without even making an API call. In my scenario, what I did, I did not have validation in GraphQL. Yet. I had only at the node part. So what happens? GraphQL do send any kind of request that comes to it. And then server validates and send back the error response, which I can format the error on my need basis. Right? But what could be possibly done in a better way? GraphQL can also have your validation so that the API call itself doesn't go. You don't go to the network, right? You don't even make an API call, right? Uh, so that's like talking. Now let's understand caching. Okay, now comes the first topic of understanding your caching part. Let's go to our data uh, thingy. One minute. Okay. Now caching can be done in few ways with GraphQL. Uh, there is a generic term which we call a deep caching or a shallow cache. Considering the structure that I've shown you, server and a GraphQL sitting in between, deep caching means that your API plus your GraphQL server, both are capable of having your cache. That's a deep cache. That's a deep pagination also, actually. So uh, here in my scenario, I have caching only sitting at the GraphQL point. I don't have caching in my server, node server, okay? Now caching can be done in few ways. Uh, one is using directives. I'll show you what directive is. I'll show you how directive can be used. Other way around is to have that data source that I showed you, right? This is coming actually, uh, I'll, I'll show you like from where this is actually coming around. Let's go to resolver. This is resolvers and this is index. So if you see this data source, right? Uh, there's something called, That's called REST data source, Apollo data source REST. That's the kind of uh, plugin I'm using here right now. What it helps me with, it helps me create my key value pair. So in JSON, when we talk like JSON language, there is something called key value pair. There is a key, there is a value associated with it. Whenever an API call comes in, if the URL, URL is what? Unique, always unique. You can cache according to that particular URL request. That's how we do caching with the REST APIs. GraphQL is different. The only API that we have is slash GraphQL, right? How we cache that? Nothing is unique, right? How do we cache it? Because uniqueness is required for caching. What now we can talk and say like, okay, queries could be unique, like user ID and all, but that also a challenge. Why? If you change the sequence, so suppose if I have, uh, I'll show you. Uh, suppose I have this name, ID, price, okay? That's going to be a string value. Of course, I'm going to save it some form of string, right? And then say, if this comes, do this cache response, right? But if I change the sequence, will that two strings will be equal? No. So same response, but two different keys. It's like I'm storing data abruptly and, you know, utilizing more memory. So it's it's not, it doesn't solve my purpose, correct? So how do we cache that? We can have directives. We can have uh, the thing that I used or we can have some inbuilt libraries. So Apollo has it. So I'm using Apollo, right? Apollo has this call uh, or maybe you can have, um, there is one, one name I'm missing. Uh, I'll, I'll let you know. Anyways, uh, for this part, let's go to the caching one. I'll show you how directives can be achieved with caching mechanism. I have commented it out. So that's how you declare your de uh, directive. Okay. I mentioned that there is something called directive. It's a inbuilt keyword directive for GraphQL. It understands when you write directive. Okay. And there is something called add the rate cache control. I created that directive. I said max age is going to be a number. Max age is something like 50, 40, how many seconds you want to hold that particular data, right? 
and then refresh it so if that that data if the time expires you will make a fresh call otherwise you will give your cached data okay then you have scope scope uh, i declared that cache control scope if you see here that's an enum which is called public or a private now what is the scope does um you you guys understand session like you logged in you created one session you logged in you created a session right when we say cache to response it could have happened with respect to your sessions so there are something called public caching responses which could be available to every user nonetheless of your user id there could be something called private cached data which is only available to you okay maybe like how many products are there in your shopping cart it's not related to him right it's a separate entity for you or maybe some kind of cache response which is available for every user like my home page has some kind of data that i want to render for every user that's a kind of public thing i would love to have in my public scope okay that's that's the scope of it then you have uh, inherit max age or blah 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 that's you can have multiple other options for your uh, directive okay uh, and then how it is being used now i created a directive but how can i use that particular directive so you can have directive on your query as well as on the field of that particular query so that's a very flexible approach so i can have that directive on my post meaning every post data will be cached i can have directive on that particular title field so that only title will be cached none of the data will be cached so that's like a field directive or a query directive you can have okay now let's go to our uh, thing where i created these two instances of the apis and that's how I, i'll introduce how caching will be done okay so uh, what i'm doing here i am saying if you have your uh, uh, i mean i would like to have a singleton instance of my service okay i don't want to create multiple instances of my service so what i said if you have that particular instance of a service do use it if you don't have create one okay don't create multiple because if you create multiple that means every service will hold ca cache data every single every instance of that service will hold cache data i don't want that i don't i want only singleton thing right so that's how the data source is so data source is nothing for you it's like a, a object for holding your instances for the service i used okay post and product only two user is not being cached so that's what i mentioned in earlier phases right only two service data i am caching these two and how does it look with caching data and how does it look with the uncached data so this is the cached part now let's say i have something called so my resolver my resolver will receive four kind of arguments four kind of params which i talked one is parent second is arguments third is your context and fourth is info right these four were the arguments now let's go to resolvers so uh, let's let's say that uh, there is let's talk only in terms of product only theek hai product hum dekhte hain okay now i said i'll receive something called data source that's coming under my context that's the context param correct i did receive context param data sources which i created in the server apollo server instance all right and i say for data sources i need product api you can call get all products now how this product api is if you go to index again so this is the product api under your data sources that i am able to consume with resolver right now let's go to get all products so ha huh, there is something called memoization the term memo people have worked on react react people react you know memo have you used memo no not it bitlab ha huh, correct correct right so you understand memo what memo is right like caching your data so that's how we have there's something called memoization results that is being given to me already by what which we were using uh, apollo data results okay that's like a inbuilt functionality with apollo data results so the moment you have your data sources what it does it automatically creates some kind of key value pair for you you don't have to do your cached mechanism it will create for you okay so if there is a key value pair and there is some value sitting for that particular key you get it from this memoization results and i set this url for this base url and if not then i will say this is uh, just give me the real data 
So understand this point. Uh, when I say get by ID, I am actually hitting my node server here. This is GraphQL repo. I am hitting my node server. Okay. Caching has been done at GraphQL level, not at API level. The key value pair I am making is by the URL of particular API. I'm going to hit from GraphQL, right? Okay. Okay. So uh, basically I get my memoization results and this is the API that I need to hit. Sitting in GraphQL server, I need to hit this API to get all the product details, okay? Or get by ID. And this is the cached key. If there is a cached key, I will get the response from your cache data. Otherwise, what I do, I just hit a new service API call. Yeah, simple. That's a new, that's a way of, you know, having your cache implemented with GraphQL. And uh, I would love to see that working. So let's say I'll comment this one out. Okay. Get by product ID. Take some product ID from here. Okay. Um, suppose I take this one. So what we want to achieve, we said that, okay, give me the product detail, okay, for that particular ID, and I run the get by ID, I get it. And if you go to console, so get by ID, there is get by ID, this one, okay. Uh, if you closely see, I did not uh, have something called this is earlier cache data, that log which you see here, it's earlier one. That means it hit the new API call. Otherwise it could have been two cached. So if I hit it again, there are two logs for cache data, right? So that it get from your cache. First was a real API and second, it's a cache data that came about, okay? So that's how the cache has been working here with the products part, right? Now, uh, let's go back to pagination. I guess only a few things are left, pagination and inherent handling. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. And the architecture part I already covered. Cool. Uh, we, we all know pagination, right? Having only sets of data being passed, correct? Um, say that you have thousands of records. How you could see on one single page? You cannot. You need to have some mechanism to scroll through it, maybe like an infinite scroll. You scroll and then data come, you scroll and then data come. Or maybe like a paged number thingy, one, two, three, go previous page, go to next page, this kind of pagination. So pagination is a bit different. I mean, they have different types. You can have a, a mechanism to go to the previous page or like for infinite scroll, you can go up and then see the previous data and then scroll down and see the new fresh data. That's how it happens. Similarly, pagination can also happen at two levels. One is the REST API level, where your REST APIs are actually capable of giving you a paginated response, correct? Right, it gives you like a bunch of data and you can have your GraphQL sitting in between also able to have your paginated responses, okay? In my scenario, because you all are very comfortable with REST APIs, right? You have might have done your pagination with REST. I did not do paginated with uh, pagination with my rest. Okay, what I did, there could be a scenario because see, uh, when we introduce pagination to to API calls, it could have happened at the initial point when you are actually creating your APIs. But there are some scenarios when situation based and uh, requirements come, and now you need your API to get paginated. There could be some scenarios, right? So at what time you what you can do? Either you go back, create some versioning of that particular API, make it a paginated response, or what you can have. If you have GraphQL or maybe some BFF layer sitting in between, right? Have that pagination logic there. 
it depends on like how soon are you want to deploy things how soon are you want to achieve that particular thing how how um, how much margin you have for that tech debt tech debt is like you know doing things for improvements so that's called a tech debt so let's say our example for pagination now we are covering two kind of pagination one is your offset based pagination one is your cursor based pagination optimized way is cursor one and i'll tell you why it is a optimized way and the other one is offset so offset is a very simple uh, statement so it says that um i'll say suppose that we are sitting in a row like this first line okay you are one id two id three id four id all right i'll say start with id first give me later three okay that's that's how it is done like offset based now suppose somebody else like he comes and sit in between now my data is shifted you understand A array have that data shifting problem right so suppose he comes and sit in between now i i do not get that updated data right so that's a problem with this kind of approach when you have offsets and limits okay now there is something called uh, because offset says acha theek hai start with one or start with second or start with third and then give me five but what if somebody sits before that now three will change to four because if you are two and somebody sits on your right hand side now you are not two longer you are three actually that's called data shifting problem okay so this is uh, the drawback for your offset and limit though it is fine with the you know smaller data batch but uh, it's not good for uh, continuously changing data types cursor based approach on the other hand is different it goes with a unique id it doesn't go like acha theek hai starting wala 3 de do mujhe 4 de do no it doesn't go like this it goes with a very unique id okay that unique id you can get from db or what you can do you can convert it to your base 64 that can happen so for my example i'm converting it to base 64 part okay utf8 base 64 i'm converting otherwise you can have a unique id and that could be uh, considered as your cursor okay so what does cursor do i'll give my query a statement that hey this is the cursor go to that cursor and after that cursor give me n number of records now because i've stated a cursor not like a first second third which could have data shifting problem id will always be u all right it could happen in both ways i can say this is your cursor go after the cursor or go before the cursor like a left and right way you can get the data okay that's how a cursor based approach is so now let's see a practical example how cursor and how a offset can work okay um let me see which one had the cursor one which one had uh, the other one hmm. so that's the cursor one and this is being used in product all right and um, so okay so let's see this example on line number 57 just to be uh, specific we have something called get post pagination okay uh this is under your post service i am supposed to get some paginated data here right if you see the arguments i have something called page and there is something called limit page is what page number one page number two page number limit is the number of data that i'll get right i am using caching here as well with the paginated response also okay now there is something called uh, i mean the everything works same with the caching part if you have cache data give me the cache data if you don't have cache data give me the real data but one thing is common with the cache data i am doing something called pagination right modulating my data according to my offset basically your page and the limit part so let's go to this function what it does it accepts your page it accepts your limit part okay and what i am doing i am having something called start index so you know in arrays you have seen that zero is the first element right so suppose that page number a user will not give you page zero for user it's nothing zero it's always start with one but with you it's always start with zero so what i'm doing i'm creating a start index page minus 1 into the limit and having your end index and basically just slicing the response so api gave me the entire data but i'm just slicing the response that's a offset part offset and limit part okay a simple one right i can show you get page in the data part on the query so let's go here okay 
Acha so the post page emission. The name is actually post page emission. This one. Okay. So I say that uh, give me the post. The query name is post page emission. Okay. So I have my page. I have my limit. This is the variable section where you de declare it. So my page is one. My limit is two. You have already seen there were a lot of posts. I can show you in the DB as well. So if you try to post, there are a lot of posts available. Okay. The REST API will give me the entire 12 records. Okay. But GraphQL will actually slice it. So now I say that page is one. Okay. And my limit is two. So for every page, there will be two records. Right. What is the error? Debugger that uh, in response. So that's how I get my post page in every response. I get only two records. Yeah, there were like 12 records in the back end. I get two. That's offset, uh, offset part of pagination. I can do it via cursor as well. So for cursor, right? Um, like I mentioned, you can go to the next page, you can go to the previous page, right? Here, I don't get that kind of flexibility. I just get page one and this data, okay? That logic we can, of course you can have it, but you have to like implement it, right? Now let's understand what a cursor is. Basic is data shifting problem that we had with the offset part. And of course it is not really optimized. So let's understand uh, the other one, which is under product, cursor page emission. Okay, so we understood what cursor is. So we have a unique ID, you get your limit and you pass the data. So I'll just show you this thing first. Let me show you. So if you see that, I do receive something called edges, cursor, node, right? So what it mentions, my total count is what six? That mean uh, there will be there will be like six records in total, but I'll give you only how many? Three, because that's the limit that I have set here. So if you see this part, I set cursor, and after that cursor, give me first n, like first three, first four, whatever, right? So that's first, which is three. So after that cursor, I got three responses. So that's how paginated response works with cursor. And the achievement that I have is I, these are the edges. So if you remember in the schema, uh, schema I did mention, we'll cover that pagination, page info and all, right? So that's how it's been uh, created. So I did create something called product connection, which had total count, which had page info, which had edges and page info is end cursor. That's the end of your data. That's has next page. Do I have more data or not, right? Has previous page, can I go back or it's the starting page, right? Is it having a start cursor and all? So that's how this pagination thing works, okay? So as I said, you can have shallow pagination or maybe a deep pagination. That's how what we covered. Like in my case, it was what? It was a shallow pagination. It didn't have a deep pagination, right? Problems with GraphQL, you have schema duplication. You have schema duplication because you have sitting it on your server side as well as on the client side. This can be resolved by having, there is a tool called uh, like for schema generation, we do use multiple tools, like a, a code gen is one of them, GraphQL code gen you can have. So basically it creates one source of truth. So your GraphQL server connects to your uh, uh, client server. They both are in touch. And once you run that particular script, it will be like one single truth for both of both of the places. So that's how you can resolve that. Uh, too many database calls that can happen. I mean, because we have like complex nested queries that it could happen. We can have batching and caching. 
so batching is like creating batch suppose i have to go to database suppose that you are at your home right your mother sends you to multiple times to the kitchen you would say na ke yaar ek bar mein batao please so that's how database batching works right you ask that if i go to db you have same kind of operation just give me at once that's how batching and caching works caching we already covered right then we have complex query so as you, as i mentioned right there could be very nested and complex queries there should be some sort of uh, like a threshold that if it is nested up to three levels that's the limit otherwise it will have performance issues so that you can resolve by having some kind of limitations to the nesting of the queries then we have web caching complexity rest apis are rest of course easier to cache graphql has some learning curve on the top of it when you really want to have cache data we have already seen the directives you can have or maybe with your uh, data sources like apollo that provides we have file upload is something which rest does it very seamlessly but with graphql you need to have uh you know do some some other operations with that but yes of course we have some other tools we have something called graphql upload where you can utilize it and upload the files okay which companies are using it these are the companies so you have facebook instagram shopify twitter and of course the, it it might be more than that that's the only companies famous and they are using medium coco medium you might have used for your posts and you know that kind of a um a blog post and yes of course that's that's it we are done no more uh, <laughs> code and all and that's uh, you can scan it and give your feedback for both of the calls like for um vishal as well as mine and if you have any questions anything please free to us that's all